tonight about the importance of Bible prophecy. <clears throat> and uh, this introduces us to the overall theme and purpose of prophecy in the Bible. How many of you know that God has a plan for history? We're not just lost in space, you know, wondering if we can find some habitable planet. Well, uh, we are going to find place for all eternity with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're getting the sound adjusted here. And so this plan started in a garden resulting in the fall of humanity into sin and it's heading toward the city with a cross in between. And we see that God uh, work, has worked at, in different ways at different times through history, we call these the dispensations or administration of uh, God's plan for history. And we see that uh, before the fall, it was different, as I've said. Afterwards, let your conscience be your guide. That didn't work out very well. It resulted in the flood, Noah. And after the flood, we see scriptures where man was heading in the same downward trajectory. What does God do? calls out Abram, or the Chaldees, and starts building his plan of redemption. You know that the Abrahamic covenant, first mentioned in Genesis chapter 12, is repeated 20 times in the book of Genesis the rest of the way through. And so that's important, that uh, God is going to implement his plan through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants known as Israel. That's why Israel is so important. And of course, Israel's back in the land. It's heightened our expectations that we could be very near the end. And then we see him working and bringing Jesus into the world at just the right time as Galatians. And Christ dies on the cross for our sins, a substitutionary atonement. And he raises from the dead. He goes away, and he says that he's going to come back for us. Hey, it's been almost 2,000 years. Why has it been so long? Well, because he's taking out a people from the Gentiles, for example, it says in Acts chapter 15. Then he'll return and rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. So God's grace is demonstrated by these 2,000 years of the gospel going all over the world. And today it is all over the world. And then we have the rapture of the church. And we'll talk about this a lot. Why the rapture? It's to end the temporary church age so God can complete the 70th week of Daniel, known as the tribulation period. And then returns to rescue Israel. The second coming is a rescue where he then sets up the millennial kingdom for a thousand years, then earth history ends, and then we go into eternity, for all eternity. So prophecy is an important part of the Bible. It's approximately 28%. Now that's just strict prophecy. For example, a book like Galatians has only 1% prophecy, but 60% of the book of, Revel of Galatians has to be interpreted based on your view of prophecy. So you can't really handle accurately the Word of God without handling accurate prophecy. That's 31,124 if you're counting. And 8,352 verses contain prophecy. And so that's why we're having a prophecy conference. It's important. And the church has been here, as I said, for 2,000 years. And you think it's about time. Well, Prophetic statistics include 1,845 verses in the Old Testament. It's the theme of 17 books in the Old Testament prophecy. 318 verses in the New Testament prophecy is in all but three books. Seven out of every ten chapters or one out of every 12 verses prophetic in the New Testament. And as I say, there's spillover uh, things that if you get the interpretation of prophecy wrong in particular passages, it affects the broader passage, the broader understanding of the book. Prophecy starts primarily in 
in the book of Deuteronomy. You realize that? Uh, 32% of Deuteronomy is prophetic. I tend not to think that way about Deuteronomy, but it is. And it lays out in chapters 28, 29, 30, around in there, it lays out a basic overview of prophecy for Israel. Also in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And then you see the, the prophets coming along and expanding on that. And uh, every book except the book of Jonah gives future prophecy of the prophets is prophecy that is still yet to be fulfilled. And that doesn't include the Psalms. All kinds of prophecies, many of the Psalms. Not always, not in every Psalm, but in many of the Psalms. And then you come to the New Testament. You have the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 19, around in there. And then you have prophecy, uh, for example, in First and Second Thessalonians. That's where Paul lays out the eschatology or the end times prophecy relating to the church. And then there's the book of Revelation, right? <laughs> it's like 96% prophetic or something like that. It's very, very thing. And the book of Revelation basically has between 650 and 800 allusions to the Old Testament. And not once does it have a direct quotation, like you see in the Gospels where it says, just as Isaiah said, and then it quotes it. That's called an introductory formula, followed by a quote. And, but it has all of those allusions, where it's, and it functions in a way to take and organize all of those prophecies scattered throughout the prophets, especially, into an organized sequence of events. And so you can go back and fill in... Uh, the depth even more in the book of Revelation. Uh, how many times you taught Revelation, Pastor? A number of times. <laughs> I figured since he was very interested in Bible prophecy. But prophecy is said to be inspired by God in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. He says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Now this is not talking about interpreting prophecy here. It, what it's saying by what it says is that prophecy isn't produced by some person looking out and giving their human, uninspired interpretation of what's going on. That's what this means. Uh, it's not people just like on the 6 o'clock news or on CNN, especially not CNN, but <clears throat> or any other network that is trying to give you an interpretation of what's happening like the Sunday shows, for example, uh, which were all at church, and so we don't know about those, do we? But nevertheless, uh, those kind of things where they're interpreting it. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. See, uh, these people didn't say, well, I want to be a prophet when I grow up and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, no, it, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And this word moved is, is used in the book of Acts of the wind blowing a sail boat, for example. And so it's something God initiates and God gives through people that were the recipients of his revelation that we find in the scripture. In fact, there were two truth tests given in the book of Deuteronomy. First was in Deuteronomy 18, where it says if a prophet or dreamer of dreamers gives you a prophecy and it doesn't come to pass, then you know they're off. But Deuteronomy 13, the second truth test says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dream arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. In other words, if he, even if he gives a, a sign or a miracle, if his content, if his theology, if it's what he says goes against Scripture, then it says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or of that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. See, loving the Lord involves knowing the word of God and testing what some people say about the word of God. 
to make sure that you are being properly devoted to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So this is the truth test, and, and it says, but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God and brought you, who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord has commanded you to walk, so you shall purge evil from among you. So in Israel, <laughs> if you had a false prophet, that person was supposed to end up a rock pile. They were supposed to be stoned. Now we don't have any examples in the Old Testament of this actually happening, we know in the New Testament they tried to stone the woman caught in adultery and things like that, but that shows you how important biblical prophecy is. Now, in the New Testament, you have a similar test in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 and verse 6. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they be from God. How do you test the spirit? By the content of what the spirit is allegedly saying or producing because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And he says in verse 6, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. In other words, the apostles. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In other words, God established revelation. Say, for example, the first five books of the Bible. And every all other future revelation was to match up to the first five books of the Bible. And so all subsequent revelation was to be in continuity, content-wise, with the Bible that has already been uh, given. And so that's why uh, there is a dual authorship of Scripture, God and man, different people who he used to speak his word, known as prophets. And that's why uh, we have this established in the Old and the New Testament and why that is the focus of knowing what is right and knowing what is wrong. Not the quiver in your liver or the feeling that you may feel, oh, I have a, I feel a tremor in the force, you know, type thing, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, that is not biblical. It's through the content of what a person says or doesn't say. Prophecy proves that God exists. In fact, the book of Isaiah is a lawsuit being brought by Isaiah against the nation of Israel for not uh, following the Constitution and the uh, arrangement that God had set with them to obey him. And so he sends Isaiah, and it says in chapter 1 that this is a reeve, that's the Hebrew word for lawsuit, and he's suing the nation. And about halfway through the lawsuit, God starts mocking them. God is using sarcasm. And he kind of says, present your case, the Lord says. In other words, you're not doing too well so far. Bring forward your strong arguments, the king of Jacob says. Let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place as the former events declare what they were, that was the right interpretation of the past, that we may consider them and know their outcome or announce to us what's coming. Tell us. Declare the things that are going to come afterwards that we may know that you are God's. Indeed, do good or evil that we may be anxiously look about us and fear together. So he's challenging them. Uh, you're not doing too well in this lawsuit. Why don't you uh, do some things that uh, only God can do to show that you're really representative of God? And of course they couldn't and they didn't. There's a number of those kind of things in that part of Isaiah. He goes on in verses 46, 10 through 11 and says, in other words, it doesn't say, I hear people downgrade this verse. They say, God knows the end from the beginning. Oh, really? Look at what the scripture actually says. He's declaring the end from the beginning. Of course he knows the end from the beginning. He's omniscient. But he declares the end from the beginning. It's one thing to say, I know my team's going to win. But you don't tell anybody. Uh, 
you got to tell them up front if you think that that's significant. But here God declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. You know, as fallen creatures, it's not good for us to follow our good pleasure, you know, our feelings. But if you're God, who's holy and right, it is good. And he's saying, all my good pleasures are going to be accomplished. Calling bird of prey, there's an example. From the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken, truly I'll bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. Well, guess what? The book of Isaiah predicts by name Cyrus 200 years in advance before he came on the scene. It is I who says of Cyrus, that's Darius the Mede, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And I'm assuming he was an unbeliever. Maybe he wasn't. But uh, God can even cause unbelievers to do his will. And he declares of Jerusalem, she shall be built and the temple and your foundation will be laid. That is what Darius did. He sent the Jews back after their 70-year captivity to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild uh, that. And that Cyrus is also known as Darius the Mede. And so he, here's a guy, a prophecy that was fulfilled in the relatively near future from when it was given. And we have a lot of old prophecies going all the way back to Genesis that haven't been fulfilled yet. So let's look at some of these prophecies leading up to the, the uh, prophecies about Jesus being the Messiah. And uh, they say there's well over 110, 111, 112 or something like that, but we're not going to deal with all of them tonight. Everybody's going, Phew. But we'll deal with some of them to give you an idea of how significant the prophecy about Jesus was. And, the, and this, this is how you know Jesus is the Messiah. Prediction that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5.2. And we see that fulfilled in Matthew 2.1. Uh, not in Jerusalem, where any good Jew at that time would have thought the Messiah would be born, but in Bethlehem, a small little town south of Jerusalem. He predicted that Messiah would be from Abraham's seed, Genesis twenty-two eighteen, 18, and we see this in Luke 3, 23, and verse 34 as well, fulfilled. He was a descendant of Abraham. And then he narrows it down even more. He's a descendant of Abraham Isaac, Genesis 21, 12, and the same Luke 3 passages show its fulfillment. You see the, that Messiah would be, a born, would be a son of Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's narrowing it down. Numbers 24, 17 makes that prophecy. And of course he was, as Luke 3 points out as well. And then you see that Messiah would pre-exist before his birth. Wow. Micah 5, 2. And we see Colossians 1.17 explaining that concept, that God, Jesus was the second person of the Trinity who incarnated himself. By the way, he's going to exist in, in the incarnation form for the rest of eternity. Figure that one out. Well, the prediction that Messiah's mode of death would be crucifixion. Isaiah 53 describes it, Psalm 22. And this was hundreds of years before the Romans invented crucifixion. It's described for you in the Old Testament. And, of course, Matthew 20, chapters 26 and 27 describe Christ's bloody crucifixion. And that Messiah would be rejected by his own people, Psalm 118.22. And, of course, you read the New Testament, that's very clear, is it not? The leadership led that. By the way, it's estimated about 30% of Jewish people in the first century accepted Christ as their Messiah. So it's, it's probably a lot more than the average person may think, even though the nation as a whole rejected him. Then you have Messiah would be pierced in his side in the crucifixion process in Psalm 22:14, and that's fulfilled in John 19:33. And that was a, a, an abnormal part of crucifixion. In other words, this is an anomaly that was thrown in because Jesus gave up his life 
willingly. He died after three hours on the cross, and they usually it took a couple of days, and that's why they invented crucifixion, so it'd be cruel and uh, a, a long punishment death. And so because he gave up his spirit, then uh, they put the spear in his side because when your heart would burst in the process of crucifixion, then you'd have blood mixed with water and out came blood mixed with water. And so that was not part of normal crucifixion that, we, uh, that was part of it normally. So the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Zechariah 9.9. 9. And, of course, it was fulfilled in Luke 19, 37. And next, see, that's a non-military vehicle, if you will. (laughs) When Jesus comes back, he's going to be riding on a a military vehicle, a white horse. He's coming militarily. And I remember one time Janice and I were in that area across from the Temple Mount where they often bring you for your first thing when you go to Israel. And always, every time we've been there, there's a guy with a donkey and a camel. At least, I don't know if inflation's gotten them, but it was used to always be one American dollar. And uh, some reason, people all wanted to ride the camel, not the donkey. And we were there one time, and this little Arab boy shouts to our crowd, Jesus, no ride camel. Jesus, ride donkey. You ride donkey. That was his pitch. <clears throat> and no one took him up, so he got on his donkey and rode off. But nevertheless, I know exactly what that's like there. So there's a prediction that Messiah would be resurrected from the dead. Woo. Psalm 16, verse 10. And we see that this was fulfilled in Acts 2, 31. It's mentioned as him having risen from the dead in Peter's sermon there. And we see that the prediction that Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah 11, 12. Not 31, not 29, not 30 pieces of gold or anything else. Matthew 26, 15 records that, being, that happening. And you know the story of Judas getting 30 pieces of silver to betray him, and he goes out and throws it down in the Kedron Valley and hangs himself and his body fell down and, you know, all of that stuff. And I guess he didn't get his money's worth. And then it predicts that Messiah would be buried in a rich man's tomb. And all Jesus owned was the little thing around him. That was it. It It's the only thing he owned. But yet he's buried in a rich man's tomb, as Isaiah 53, 9 says, and recorded in the New Testament in Matthew 27, 60. And we, then we see the prediction by Jesus that Jerusalem would be destroyed. And we see this a number in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 19, Luke 21. And sure enough, 58, 57 years later, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. That's a whole thing. If you ever go to Israel, there's a lot of stuff relating to that destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So, you also have the prophecies of Daniel's 70 weeks that we're going to look at in our next talk more. And basically, it predicted the very day that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And you see March 5th, 444 B.C., and these are based on 360-day years. 69 weeks of years equals March 30th, A.D. 33. just happened to be the very day of Christ's triumphal entry. And four days later, it says after, the, after those days, Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And we'll see in the next talk how he didn't have any of the six things that are mentioned in Daniel 9.24, and yet the 70th week, known as the tribulation, is postponed. So we'll look at that more, but that's a prophecy that was fulfilled literally, you see. So, we see here, it recorded in Luke 19, and when he approached, he saw the city and wept over it. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, in other words, on this very day, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, 
For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you, A.D. 70, and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And I would just say to anybody here tonight who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, you need to realize and recognize your time of his visitation to you would be tonight to trust him as your Savior. And so Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy predicts the precise time of Israel's history. Uh, The first 69 weeks of years relate to Christ's first coming, and the final week of years relate to Christ's second coming, as we'll see in the next talk here. So, and this prophetic fulfillment is like a personal mailing address. Uh, Let's say that you're sending this to the United States. That eliminates it from about 250 other countries in the world. And then let's say you're sending it to Texas, one of 50 states, although the greatest and grandest, but nevertheless, I'll move on here. Uh, And let's say you're sending it to El Paso, one city in Texas, just barely, but it is, right? (laughs) And you're sending it to zip code 79936, narrows it down inside El Paso. And you're sending it to Elm Street, and then a particular house on Elm Street, 1721, if there is such a place in El Paso, I don't know. (laughs) And you're sending it to John Smith. And that narrows it down to a single individual in the whole world. That's what Bible prophecy did in relation to Jesus Christ. He's the only person that could have fulfilled it. And this gives us confidence that what we're trusting in is true. Because he fulfilled these prophecies. And he's offered salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, through faith alone in him. And therefore... He's going to come back. And if if he fulfilled his promise the first time, he's going to do it the second time. So prophecy provides a realistic expectation for what the future holds. We do not live in a world where anything can happen. Events will unfold as God has planned for them to occur. And so when you look at an overview of the future, we see that the the church age ends with the rapture. Then you have the seven-year tribulation. The church experienced the Bema evaluation period in heaven during this time. The marriage of the Lamb takes place right before the second coming. We come back with Christ, and then he destroys every unbeliever in the world, and then we go into the millennial kingdom, and then eventually the eternal state. That's kind of an overview of what's going to happen in the future. So if you look at it this way, you had the, the, the destruction of the temple in AD 70, and the church age doesn't have prophecy in the same way that you have in the Old Testament and in the future for Israel. Prophecy relating to the church is only about general trends, like in Matthew 13, where you have the parables that talk about the general trend. And basically, when you put that together, it says that the, the church will continue to grow but at the same time, it will become increasingly apostate. Do you know that warnings about apostasy is the second most frequently mentioned topic in the New Testament? And yet most churches rarely even mention it or talk about it. They're too busy having happy day or whatever, you know. And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, that's exactly what's happened. Christendom... Christendom means everything related to Christianity. Cults, Roman Catholicism, Greek Orthodoxy, liberal Protestantism, everything. Christendom is about a half a billion people more than Islam. So it's the largest religion in the world, so to speak. And so it's grown all over the world. Now, there's still a lot of missionary work to do. Don't worry. The 144,000 Jewish witnesses, the uh, angel preaching the gospel in the book of Revelation to every tribe, country, tongue, or nation, smallest people group that you can come up with, 
are going to make sure, with, in addition with normal evangelism, that everybody hears before the second coming. So if people are left at the rapture, they will still be evangelized during that time. And so I believe the <clears throat> seven churches show a kind of a secondary purpose for them is to show a, the prophetic movement of the church age in a, in a general sense. And, of course, that would put us in the Laodicean age, the, the church that God vomits out of his mouth, so to speak, as as B.B. Warfield, a theologian, said that the Laodicean church is vomited into the tribulation. And uh, the true believers, of course, are raptured. And, of course, that's what the purpose of the rapture of the church. I'm going to say it all weekend. It's to end the temporary church age. That's why it has to be pre-trib. To finish the 70th week of Daniel, which is for Israel. So, you got raptures happening all over the place here. <clears throat> so the rapture of the church will occur before the tribulation and will include all believers. You don't have to do any special thing after you become a believer to be taken in the rapture. In fact, some of my preterist friends, people who believe it all happened in, in AD 70, for example, they're going to go up kicking and screaming. I'm going to go up saying, na, 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 na. <laughs> But you know that won't happen because the moment the rapture occurs, I'll have a resurrection body and not this same sinful body, you know, that wants vengeance on people I disagree with. So we're all going up. I, I spoke in China about 10 years ago, and there are people there that never heard of the rapture. People didn't even know Israel was a nation, some of the people there. They're so isolated. We had people from all over China came and we taught them for a week. It was very interesting. So there's the rapture again. And I believe there'll be an interval of probably months or years between the rapture that ends the church age and the signing of the covenant between Israel and the revived Roman Antichrist. And I'll talk about that later. But the first rider on the white horse comes and he uh, takes peace from the earth and he heads up a western confederation. I don't think, some people think it's divided into ten regions around the world. I don't. I think it's a ten nation confederacy, the revival of the Roman Empire to some degree. And they are the ones, and I think that uh, Islam is going to be taken out by the Gog-Magog battle that I'll talk about later and probably remove them as a, a global power and that will help the European Union uh, develop into the, the Antichrist kingdom. Uh, what about the United States and China even? Well, we don't know. We're not mentioned. Uh, so some people say, well, we're going to get nuked. Well, we don't know. That may be that China and the U.S. nuke each other or something like that. But nevertheless, and I'm not suggesting that at all, heavens forbid. And Israel is protected with this agreement between the revived Roman Antichrist uh, to protect Israel in the first half. But even, so the apostate church, as I said, goes in, the Jewish Levitical system comes back, with the temple and everything, the temple's rebuilt. And I think the seal and trumpet judgments occur in the first half. A lot of people put the trumpet judgments in the second half, and I'm not going to die over that position, not even on a good day. But nevertheless, uh, that's my understanding. And so right in the middle of the tribulation, Michael the archangel drop kicks Satan and his angels out of heaven. They lose we could go back to the book of Job and all of this and show you how Satan has some access to God. You know, he picked a fight with Job and all those things like that. But nevertheless, he is limited to planet Earth. And he, the, the Antichrist, I believe, is killed at the midpoint, and he's resurrected. It says that four times in the book of Revelation, the same word that's used of Christ's resurrection. Can Satan resurrect people? No. I believe God's going to do it. 
as part of the deception for the unbelieving world at that time. And he then <clears throat> becomes global, becomes a global kingdom. He becomes a world ruler at that point. And Israel is persecuted. That's why in the midpoint that they flee to Petra. <clears throat> we could go on and on about it. A lot of stuff there to Petra. They're in Jordan. And the worship of Satan and Antichrist is required. You have to get the mark of the beast, 666. Uh, if uh, you, and there'll be all kinds of martyrs, but there will be Christians that survive to the second coming as they go into the millennium to repopulate the world in mortal bodies. It, and I believe the bold judgments, which are the most severe ones, occur right months before the second coming. You have the eight stages of Armageddon. It unfolds in eight phases or stages. We'll talk about that more. And then you have Christ returning to rescue Israel. Scripture seems to indicate that if he didn't come at that seven-year period after the beginning of the tribulation, that the Jewish nation would be wiped out. And so he comes to rescue his people. Now, that gets us into the millennium. And Jesus brings from heaven a one-mile square temple that is too big for the current 35-acre temple mount. And there's going to be topographical changes, as you know, at the end of the tribulation. It says every island is sunk in the sea, every mountain comes down. And we know from Isaiah 2 that the mountain of the Lord rises up and becomes the highest place on planet Earth for the millennium for, to reflect the fact of God, Christ's rulership over the world. And the, a new temple, the fourth temple, you have the tribulation temples, the third temple, and then the fourth temple comes down for the millennium, and it is coming down from heaven. They're not going to have to build that one. And so key events during the millennium, Christ is now on David's throne, ruling from Jerusalem. Uh, is, uh, Jerusalem's the capital of the world. And you have sub-rulers. I don't know, maybe your pastor will get some large country or something. And some of us might get to rule a small town somewhere. But nevertheless, you have the removal of the curse except for death. It's totally removed except for death. You have the millennial temple, as we've already talked about, and temple sacrifices. Some people are greatly offended by that. But when you look in uh, Ezekiel 42 and 43, where it talks about them five times, it, <coughs> it's not the type of sacrifices that recapitulate the death of Christ. These are the type of sacrifices that are for the cleansing of the temple and the priests, you see? to make them ceremonially clean. Uh, I've got to go with the literal interpretation of the Word of God there and not be offended somehow that it besnurts the finished work of Christ. It doesn't. It's simply because you're, Israel is the ruler over the world. You have the restoration of these temple services and sacrifices in that way. And uh, therefore, say to, at the end of the thousand years, you have people very prosperous. They don't have to worry about money or anything. And they will have, I think, large families. They'll be, uh, you'll be able to live a thousand years. It's part of the curse that's removed. And uh, there'll probably be billions and billions of people in the millennium. And some of, many of them will not trust Christ as their Savior, even though they could go to Jerusalem and shake hands with Jesus so to speak. Some, and so it demonstrates that the heart, the problem is the heart disease of man, his rejection of, of God's grace. And this is further demonstrated during this era or dispensation of the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. And then, then Satan is released from prison. He's put in jail where the other two are cast into the lake of fire. Uh, and he is released, and somehow he energizes everybody to come and attack Jerusalem. And God, instead of taking seven years to uh, get rid of him, he zaps them with fire from heaven. 
and ends that, and thus history ends, and you go into the eternal state. And in the transition, you have the great white throne judgment where only unbelievers are held accountable. I'm sure we'll be there to watch as believers, but every person will be given a... The books were opened, Revelation 20, 12, and another book was opened. So you have books, plural, and a book, which is the book of life. And, you know, they do their due diligence of checking to make sure your name's not written in the book of life so they won't make a mistake. And the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books. See, that's got every deed that every person has ever done. But what does Isaiah say about human deeds? They're like filthy rags. That's the best we have to offer. You know, I always think of Jerry Lewis's telethons, which were great for the hospital and everything. But I also noticed he kind of had a arrogance about himself that he was doing this wonderful thing. Even stuff like that are filthy rags in the sight of God because it's done in rebellion against God by not bowing the knee to Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so someone asked me, do you think God's upgraded to computers? Well, I don't know. I don't know that he needs computers, but he's going to have a record of everything unbelievers did, and they're going to be rejected. And so there they are. They're cast into the lake of fire, and the dead are being collected. And I like to use the illustration. It's like going to the county jail when you commit a crime, and then you have your trial, and then you're sent to the... to. Uh, I'm from Texas. I should know this. What? No. Uh, the town. What's the town? Huntsville. Yes. You're sent to Huntsville. My mama used to say, if you don't straighten up, son, you're going to end up in Huntsville. <laughs> you know? Little did she know I went to Sam Houston State. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> went to Southwest Texas. <laughs> Uh, and ha hard pain, Baptist, one of the eight Southern Baptist colleges in Texas. Can you name the other seven? <laughs> but that's a whole other discussion. But they are then cast into the lake of fire, and that's when they are judged according to their deeds. They reject Christ? Okay, great. We'll judge you according to your deeds. Oh, by the way, you're going to be measured to God's holy righteousness. You know, I saw a bumper sticker once in Austin that said, uh, hell's of, uh, heaven won't have me and hell's afraid I'll take over. And that's kind of the attitude. We're going to go to hell and we're going to all drink beer and play pool you know, and have a wonderful time. That's a lot of people's view of, of hell. I'm sorry it's not going to be that way. It's a very serious issue. And so we see the book of Revelation ending where it says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. It ends with an invitation. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. See, you've got to have that thirst to know the Lord. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. It's, it's available. The living water that Jesus talked about in John 4. That if you drink of, you'll never thirst again. And so this is the invitation as we close this session that if you don't know Christ as your Savior, come and accept him and his death on the cross has paid for your sins. You admit you're a sinner and Christ died to pay for your sins and through simple faith, which is trust. Just like every time you sit in a chair, you're trusting that chair that it will hold you up. And on rare occasions, sometimes it doesn't. I had that happen to me once, but that is how you become a believer, and God gives you a new heart and a new desire and a new spirit. Well, with that, I'm out of here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have this wonderful plan for us as fallen creatures that you as the God-man came and died in our place as the second Adam. And we thank you so much 
for something we didn't deserve at all. But in your grace, you did it. And here we are 2,000 years after that, and we're still waiting for you to come, but we know you are going to come back to take us to be with you to the Father's house. And we look forward to that time. And we ask that you'd be with us during the rest of this conference as we learn more about these things that you've revealed in Scripture. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.